que morirían con él. La anciana hace que Clock conozca al joven y ambos se hacen amigos, van de excursión por los bosques de Boulogne y Fontainebleau. Clock recolecta hojas, cortezas y raíces, acuden a los parques de la ciudad y tienen problemas con la gendarmería al trepar a un viejo castaño y cuando en el zoológico de Jardin de Plante intentan liberar a los halcones. El joven va aprendiendo la lengua y los ritos, y cuando Clock se resfría y muere de una pulmonía, hereda su tambor y canta frente al cadáver, en compañía de la anciana, en una lengua que ha milagrosamente sobrevivido a su último hablante. In those days, I came into contact with writers and themes that would mark my life. I had to read a long novel by Paul Neptune, which after a few pages took over my days. Along with its literary quality, the text generated a magical transformation of sorts. It showed me a way into making mine the city where I felt like a stranger. Neptune, playful, playful and brilliant, had taken the map of a Parisian city block and was weaving the stories about all its inhabitants. Beginning with the social habits of a fraction of the city, he mixed together all the classes, the most diverse personalities, professions, <coughs> tragedies, flare-ups, and accidental events. Nep Neptune's narrator created an experience similar to the one we have in childhood when we first immerse ourselves totally in a book. The afternoons and nights felt too short for me to get through the over 600 pages in small print of Rue de Babylon. Neptune had died the year before, when he was still young. During my first days in the apartment, this felt to me like a personal loss. I could no longer meet the man who, via his storytelling, allowed me to come to terms with the city where I was always walking. I soon acquired all his books and the literary journals that had dedicated issues to his work. I formed an idea of his biography, the early death of his parents, his stay in several orphanages, his early passion for books and chess. He had not embarked on a university career. He was prepared, perhaps led by the great necessity of having to support himself to do whatever was needed. For years, he distributed adver advertisements in the streets, gathered public opinion as a pollster, organized the files of a paleontologist, and finally, when he had acquired some notoriety, he worked for a weekly no newspaper, writing a famously eccentric page on chess. The descriptions of the objects on his work table, gathered in two or three articles admired by his devoted readers, were miniature sagas that from a certain perspective were comparable to the great novels of the 19th century. He was invisible. His country, if he had one, was a modest apartment in a neighborhood of Paris. Literature inspires brotherhoods of the imagination. The affinity that sometimes forms between a text, an author, and a reader is one of the wonders of life. Nobody can forget when this happens, just as nobody can forget when he or she finds out that such a connection is only an illusion. My move to the studio was marked by the stories of the inhabitants on that block of a fictional city, and from then on, Paris became a world that was an indisputable, indisputable part of my life. One of the stories in Neptune's text was about an aborigine, a dark man who lived on the ground floor of one of the buildings on the block. Nobody knew where he was from, nor how he had arrived. The young son of a blue-collar blue workers who lives in the same building listens, pressing his ear against the door, to the litanies the man hums at night. His curiosity peaked with an impulse he doesn't understand. He sets out to learn who the guy is. For days, he follows him and finds out that he sings with a drum and a bone flute in the corridors of the Maubert Mutualité metro station and that inexplic inexplicably, every week, he visits some old woman in a bourgeois apartment. Determined to get to the bottom of the enigma, the boy knocks on the elderly woman's door and enters into an unexpected universe. All the rooms and hallways are filled with indigenous artifacts that he will then learn come from the Amazon. The, wo the woman tells him the story of Clark, the Indian her anthropologist husband, who died a few years ago, brought to the city after the man's village had disappeared, the victim of slaughter, disease, and melancholy. 
Tlaloc, the last warrior of his tribe, was teaching the students at the Ecole de Deutitude, a language whose a language whose memory only he possessed, and which formed part of a rare family of languages, which constituted a kind of lost link in the anthropology of the Tupi Guarani peoples. He was also a kind of star technician for the conservancy of feather ornaments, Indian macanas, and bows and arrows in the collections of the Musée de Lome. After the death of her husband, the old lady took care of Clark as best as she could. He lived in silence since nobody, aside from a bookish anthropologist here and there, knew his language, and his French was rudimentary. He dreamed of his lost world, eating frugally, allowing himself the luxury of smoking a pipe amid rituals and gods who would die with him. The old woman arranges for Clark to meet the young man, and they become friends. They go on excursions together to the Bois de Boulogne and Fontainebleau. Clark collects leaves, barks, and bark and roots. They go to the city parks and run into problems with the police when they climb an old chestnut tree. And when, at the Jardin de Plantes Zoo, they try to free the falcons. The young man gradually learns the language and writes, and when Clark catches cold and dies of pneumonia, he inherits his drum and chants facing the corpse, accompanied by the old woman, in a language that has miraculously survived its last speaker. I would like to end the reading with a poem from book which is called Necropolis uh, and I would like to dedicate this poem to the people of institutions such as Malvern Books uh, especially in a time that, such as this one where with such urgency we see how institutions like this are menaced uh, so, after just a few days after we saw the triumph of, of ignorance, Necropolis. Vuelvo a ellos una y otra vez. Enfrento minutos, a veces horas con los libros. Los opongo al tiempo real del purgatorio. Mastico palabras que son versos. Capítulos convertidos en pedazos de cadáveres que acaso solo trajeron pan a la mesa de un impresor. Vivo en una necrópolis, pero vivo luego de una catástrofe y recorro su ciudad iletrada. Aquí los títulos de los lomos, allá el costillar de un clásico, al tornar la esquina un error de compra almacenado, cargado en mudanzas innumerables, ilegible, inútil, Ha sido desmesurado el número de escritores para los lectores del mundo. Su memoria, que también es una biblioteca atravesada por la equivocación, resulta una carga inhumana. Soy un lector. Si algo ha sobrevivido en mí es este hecho. Cargo el peso enorme de la tinta. No sé hacer otra cosa en este camino que se dirige a la utopía de la necedad. Vivo en una necrópolis, dije. Habrá algunos que me contendrán en la suya y nos desconoceremos en el desierto de las calles diarias. El mundo ha obrado contra el papel. El mundo perteneció a otros. Se entiende, pues es innecesario el peso de lo escrito para los que se piensan propietarios absolutos. Soy un sepulturero. Trabajo una lápida digna para toneladas de páginas. Otro, algún día, vivirá en la necrópolis. Otro leerá fechas, nombres, familias, amigos, generaciones. This is a translation done by Maria Eugenia Pavón. Necropolis. I return to them again and again, confronting minutes, sometimes hours, with the books, opposing them to the reality of purgatory's time. I chew on words that are verses, 
chapters turned cadaver chunks that only ever brought bread to a publisher's table. I live in a necropolis, surviving after catastrophe and roving its illiterate city. Here, some titled spines, there the ribcage of a classic. Turning the corner, I find a stockpiled purchase mistake, carried through countless relocations, illegible, in vain. The number of writers has been excessive for the readers in this world. Their memory, that is also a library, pierced by mistakes, feel, feels like an inhuman weight. I am a reader. If anything has survived within me, it's this. I carry the enormous weight of ink. I don't know what else to do on this road toward the utopian inane. I live in a necropolis, I said. Someone will include me in theirs, and we will unknow each other in the desert of our day-to-day -day streets. The world has labored against paper. The world has belonged to others. Understandable, the weight of the written is unnecessary for those who think themselves kings. I am a grave digger, building a worthy tombstone for tons and tons of pages. Another, someday, will live in the necropolis. Another will read dates and names, families, friends, generations. James.